Hi, I'm Sophie. And I'm Kate, and we're the hosts of Talking in Common podcast. Welcome to Being. Welcome back to Talking in Common. Today, Soph and I are joined by the wonderful and inspiring Josh Reed Jones. Josh is a social impact professional, social entrepreneur, and the founder of the Just Be Nice Project, which aims to change the way people help people until they are housed, employed, and have positive mental health outcomes. Also involved in several non-profit organisations, Josh works daily to engage businesses, schools, organisations, and communities in the process of creating extraordinary change in the world through making ordinary positive change. We're intrigued by his critical thinking, eye-opening perspectives and professional insight. So we are very excited to get into this one. Josh, welcome. How are you going? I'm good. Thank you for having me. What a beautiful spot we're in today for this little... (laughs) This little yarn, it's great. Nice place to be. Yeah, really good. Thank you for taking time out of your life to be with (laughs) us. So, Josh, as Soph said, we're excited to talk to you about everything you do and believe in and all the things that you're so passionate about. But first, can you tell us a little bit about who Josh is as a person, your background, and what led you to the path that you're on now? Yeah, my whole life I've just been trying to answer this question of why don't people get the help that they need when they need it for as long as they need it regardless of how they come to need help. And I think I've always been exposed to challenges that were put on people that weren't necessarily their fault. I think there's a lot of moral judgment around giving help to people and whether or not people deserve or don't deserve help. Uh, and that informs a lot of the decisions that we make in that space. But it's not. there was no epiphanous moment that came to me one day. It's something I've been thinking about since I was a kid. So we definitely want to talk about the power of people helping people. But let's just start with understanding, you know, people and their differences first. Um, When we first met with you a few weeks ago, you sort of explained a concept or an idea to Soph and I about positivity and negativity Mm. not necessarily being on opposite sides of the same coin. Mm. Can you tell us a little bit more about this? One of the challenges for delivering help when you've got such a, a broad range of problems or challenges that that happen and try not to make it too too focused on the problems of say like well-to-do white people who who dominate the space because they've got more visibility just in general so a lot of communities that are in need that by number they make up massive amounts of the planet billions of people that need help but in terms of visibility they they make up a very small percentage so and true. to make up to, to come up with frameworks that can pick up everyone and aren't just focused on looking after the people that are in front of you or the people that are the easiest to help perhaps, w- we have to develop these frameworks that are kind of a bit more universal and sort of tackle the human condition where it, where it is. Yeah. And so to do that, one of the, one of the frameworks that we have is around, is around happiness and it gives us some levers that we can used to try and see where there might be a deficiency or where we can help people and we have four four sort of pillars in that in that um, model for happiness the first one is is positivity and so we use that as we describe it as people being positive their capacity to feel positive to to have up emotions and if you can imagine a a bell curve in in your mind as a distribution, there's a small number of people who feel positive really, really easily, a small number of people who really struggle no matter what's going on, and most people are kind of in the, in the middle of the bell curve. I sit on like the, the bottom side of that bell curve a little bit, where I know that's quite difficult. I don't, I don't usually get up and about and whoop all the time. I'm not that guy, but I'm aware of the things that keep me up as high as I can get. Mm. If I'm training well, if I take the time to see my friends, yeah. if I feel like sometimes you get a bit insular and you're like, oh, I don't want to go out. And you go and you're like, I'm glad I did. Like, it's good to see people, you know, doing things at work, being mildly productive, that all helps. I think I'm the same. I think you're probably a bit the same too. You've yeah, got, to, so. got to work a bit at it. Yeah, you know? and you're it. never bouncing off the walls, but it's okay. Mm. And you just know that if you keep those things up, you're maintaining it. Mm. And so in the discussion about mental health in particular, people use negativity as being 
on the same scale. So if, you, mm. if you're in the middle or if you're a bit towards positive, it means you've got more positivity going on than negativity. But the way that we treat it is as a separate element. It's the second element in this sort of step, these sort of levers for happiness. And the negativity scale is about your capacity to bounce back from a negative state. Mm -hmm. So how quickly, how easily, what do you need to do to bounce back from this negative state? And again, you've got some people who bounce back really easily, really quickly, no dramas. And you've got some people who just get stuck. And it doesn't even have to be a big, like a big ticket item that knocks them into the doldrums, but they just end up hanging out there. And most people, again, are kind of in the middle. And if you kind of think of the... I suppose the stoic older person from the war in England or whatever who loves to complain and, but they keep calm, carry on. Mm. They complain a bit. They're not really up and about but also there's nothing's going to keep them down. They just keep going. They just keep going. Whereas we have these other people and these st stories abound in the mental health space. The life of the party, the guy who was always up and about, he was so much fun, he did all these things and then tragically... Mm make some decisions because at the moment that they were in a negative state, they could not get out of it. And, it, and it, the intensity was too much. And it's because they're different things. Your capacity to be really up and about and be the life of the party doesn't necessarily mean that you that are also able to get out of a negative state really easily. Mm. So we check those things against what people are doing and how people are to make sure that like, okay, you're really happy, that's great, but how do you go when something's difficult? check in with them when something's hard and not just assume that because you can feel really great, you're going to be able to bounce out of a negative state really quick. Yeah, and it's it's taking the time to check in if things are difficult. Again, it's looking around people. It's understanding yeah. what's going on with people. will make you better at the times where you check in. Yeah. If it's it's about, it's that's that paying attention to not what you need to do, but what's happening around you and how do we create those environments that best support people into a positive state, but also out of a negative spot if they're in one. Mm. All right, so if we go into a little bit more about people helping people, mm -hmm. um, what can you just explain like exactly what you mean by this and like what is the power of it? One of the first things that I try and help people understand is that really good help is delivered best by people who know what they're doing. And that there's a few layers to knowing what you're doing. One is knowing the people that you're, and the communities that you're trying to help really well and one is knowing the best kinds of help to give them. You've got to juggle this balance between agency for the people that you're trying to help and support and guidance for them. So with help, you're always juggling those things. Agency for the person you're trying to help or the communities you're trying to help, access to what they need to pursue the opportunities they want to pursue and how much guidance and how much sort of in, in its worst iteration it's paternal telling everyone what to do and in its best iteration you're just keeping the things up in front of them that they that help them be the best they can be the overarching thing that gets missed in a lot of conversations is trust mm. it doesn't matter if you do know everything if you're really the person who knows all the answers if someone doesn't trust you or if they don't trust the, the place that you're you're working in it doesn't matter they won't engage with the help and that usually comes from a depth of a relationship and time in with someone or it can come from deep expertise. So I guess the example I always give is if I was playing footy when I was a kid, uh, which I did, and mum goes, oh, you, you're so good at footy. And I go, whatever, mum. Like, you don't really know what you're talking about. You tell me all these things all the time. Yeah, you're there. You're biased. All, you're my yeah, biased. You just <laughs> say it. And I don't even think you really know. <laughs> But then, like, a coach might tell me in an under-16s and he's been around for six years, keeping an eye on me, he goes, hey, man, you're really coming together. Like, I think you're going really well. I go, great. There's someone who's got enough time in, who knows what they're talking about, who I trust, yeah. who's paid attention, and that means something. Mm -hmm. So th that trust piece matters. So it starts with trust. When we have trust and we build understanding, we're able to deliver better help. And the best kind of help is the help that ensures people get better. So, Josh, we want to talk a little bit about human connection mm -hmm. and the impact this has on our mental health. Um, in a lot of ways, it would seem that we're kind of more connected than ever. But then, you know, in another way, like in a world where we're so kind of hyper-connected, um, I guess we're, you know, we kind of feel a lot more disconnected than we ever have. Why would you, you know, why do you think this is? I wrote an article about this ages ago where I said, I think we're more available and we're less connected. We're, we're on call all the time, um, but the depth of connection is 
is probably not the same. Yeah. And the depth of understanding of what's going on with people is is obviously uh, takes a knock as a result of that. The two the two other elements of the happiness levers that we work on are, are focus and your ability to focus yeah. and and uh, your capacity to contribute to people because that makes a huge difference. And we're bombarded with transactional opportunities for all kinds of stuff. Mm. Transactional help, transactional sex, transactional chats, Everything. whatever. Everything you can mm. just you can just order it on demand. Yeah. Stepping away from all of those things and paying attention and valuing consistency over intensity in our relationships, I think would go a long way to improving that connection. It comes in in cycles and it's the same with relationships. Like sometimes people need you to be there. You're not used to, you don't have this idea in your head that if someone's having a difficult time that they can cycle through getting a bit better and getting worse. Over five years, it might take that long yeah. to leave an abusive relationship, to get over an addiction, to, mm -hmm. to get on top of whatever mental health challenges that they've got. And so... I think if you can me if you can meter your energy and your emotional energy based on what you can give, certainly that's important. But this idea that everyone has to serve you and everything has to help you achieve something and all that and connection for connection's sake is a waste of time. I think that we're, it does everyone a disservice if we let people think like that. So mm. hang on to your old mates and put in the time and try and try and have deep relationships where you talk about things and you're open and honest and doesn't have to be with everybody but it should be with some people you mm, should have yeah. that and if you do have that and you do have a partner it also takes a bit of pressure off the one partner to have to be all the things and wear all the hats and mm. shoulder yeah, every so emotional true, yeah. burden that you bring home as well yeah yeah i think about that a lot too like in my relationship um there's so such high expectations because you want it to be you know a good loving inspiring connected <laughs> relationship yeah. all of all the, the time, time. But you might need something that actually a friend gives you or a parent yeah. or a child and you can't expect that from one person all the time. It's just not realistic. But I think talking about, you know, the hyper connection compared to, you know, real genuine physical connection technology is obviously a, another turning point yeah. um, in society and in history that's um, played a role in where we potentially went wrong. <laughs> one, one, another principle that we have at JBN is about as often as possible – putting people with people in real life. Yeah. yeah. And I know people are a bit uncomfortable about that sometimes, but I really think it's really important to have the option there and to try and keep it up as often as possible. And digital stuff is useful, but it's a tool and I don't think it should supplant all of those things that have worked for, you know, have me 300,000 years of being humans. And so being around people actually helps you understand your own circumstances much better. Yes. Yeah. Gives you those tools to realise I'm not the first person in the history of the world to do this thing, have yeah. this emotion, feel this way. Mm. And that's really important. Mm. So we want to talk to you a little bit about moving from awareness to solutions mm -hmm. with mental health because this is something that you speak of. And I think, like, I feel like we're potentially on the brink of a real shift in, in this um, because of the increasing awareness um, but what are the solutions, in your opinion, and do you feel like we are in a position of progressing just from awareness? Some communities have got really great access to the things they need to be okay, mm. uh, and some don't. Mm. If we treat mental health as just only purely related to how you talk to people and the people in your life, then I think we've got a long way to go. If you're prepared to include in your advocacy for good mental health things like access to housing that's affordable, you know, af good jobs that aren't exploitative and that pay enough and that have good conditions, that you've got um, opportunity for your kids and for y yourself more generally as well as opportunities for leisure and all of these sorts of things, then we can move to making sure that people have good mental health outcomes. Mm -hmm. If, it's, if you're purely in the mindset that it's just all in your brain and you just need to work it out on your own, then you've got a little bit of adjusting your aspiration before we're going to get anywhere on, on helping people. So when we, if we expand the understanding of good mental health outcomes to include those environmental things, I think we can make some progress, but also I think we're quite far away from some of those being included. It's possible... We have enough resources in the planet to make sure everyone's looked after, but every day we make decisions to not do that. Mm. And so it's about how do we make decisions where people don't feel like they're losing everything they care about by looking after other people as well and including them in that 
aspiration for everyone being all right. Mm, yep. I think we've still got some way to go for, for certain communities, definitely. If you realise that you're having a trouble that everyone else has, I think it lessens the severity of the trouble. That's true. Yeah. So That's definitely true. you've got to be involved with people to do that. Mm. Josh, to finish this off, we'd love you to explain from your point of view um, what the bigger picture of positive change looks like. Look, ultimately, I think it's about making sure that everyone has all the things that they need to live into infinite possibilities. Yeah. So sometimes say possibilities to live into, not expectations to live up to. And it's, it's a combination of systemic enablers that make it easy for everyone. It's uh, a function of increased equality across not just one particular community but across the world. And, and if we have that, then I think people will be a lot happier, a lot more relaxed and, and will live richer lives and, and have more opportunities. And I think the, the sort of, if you have to put an economic lens on it, which some people need to, it's more creativity. It's more time to find good solutions and create wonderful things that benefit everybody and do all that sort of stuff and unlocking that potential in human beings everywhere instead of sort of leaving them in harm's way and leaving them languishing where they are. So that's my big ticket aspiration. And JBN ultimately, we just I hope that one day you'll just be able to call up with a drama and we'll be able to just help sort it out until you're back on your feet. That's the aspiration. Awesome. Um, so, we're, But we're a little bit off that, but ultimately that's where we're, we're headed. I love what you said, possibilities to grow into, not expectations to live up to. That's, yeah. Yeah. It's great. Josh, thank you so much for joining us today. We so appreciate you giving us your time and everything that you've shared with us. It's been such a great chat. So oh, Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And thanks for having me in this beautiful space. <laughs> thanks, Josh. <laughs>